Uh, as you, I'm sure you all know, Bob has been a longtime supporter of cognitive science at the global scale. He's established the Rommelhart Prize in Cognitive Science, which is the best, the most important prize in uh, our field. Uh, over the years, he's been a true friend and a benefactor to the department here, uh, uh, Cognitive Science at UCSD. Many of you graduate students, uh, former and current graduate students, have benefited materially from Bob's generosity in the form of a Glushko Samuelson Graduate Fellowship. Um, yay, so thank you, Bob, for that and helping us educate our students to the best of our abilities. Uh, I'm not going to take up any more of Bob's time. He's going to tell us today about this new book project of his just out called The Discipline of Organizing. Bob Glushko. Thank you. Well, it really is nice to be invited back to a program that I'm not an alumnus of, because I went alumnus before it was a cognitive science program, but that's good that you still treat me as one of you guys. Um, this project I'm going to talk about um, has a couple of motivations. It has a personal motivation and a professional motivation. The, the personal motivation is that, uh, let me skip ahead, okay. is that I'm an obsessive compulsive type personality. This, in fact, is my garage. Um, and it looks like that and because I'm organized. So I just moved from Berkeley to San Francisco. We, the trucks came on Monday. Uh, they packed on Tuesday. Wednesday, we were in San Francisco, and I was unpacked by Friday afternoon, a five-bedroom house. Um, I just got that thing in me, right? But professionally, uh, this project started because I've been teaching for the last several years at the UC Berkeley School of Information, which is this kind of dumb name for school because all schools are information schools, you hope. But it's the kind of, it's this new name for a school which is at the intersection of a lot of disciplines, library science, computer science, business, informatics, cognitive science, law, and so on. And they said, teach the core class. And I said, what is the core of this discipline? And they said, you know, the, the intersection of these things is some of this, some of that. I said, no, that's the union, not the intersection. I said, what's the intersection? They'll figure it out. So I said, I should figure this out for them so I can teach the students what this intersection is. And I decided that, in fact, uh, what is the intersection of library information science, computer science, you know, informatics, and all the other things? It's organizing. So what I'm going to do today is talk about uh, what it means to organize, uh, why we organize, how we organize, and, and then some sort of like problems and pitfalls to organizing as a way to motivate why you should think about organizing in a different way as a system rather than as a category. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the, uh, the sort of the meta project of this, which is that we had to invent a new way of thinking about what a book was for a multidisciplinary field, because if it's a multidisciplinary book, it has to be somehow still understandable by people who are coming at it from one point of view, and that's kind of a weird problem. Okay. All right, so um, I mean, organizing to me means to create capability by uh, intentionally imposing some kind of order on some set of things. And of course, organizing is one of those fundamental activities. It is, it is at the core of all cognition and perception. We often do a lot of it completely automatically. Uh, but we also do an awful lot of it intentionally uh, to make sense of the world we live in. And of course, it's also a very important part of most of our professional and business activities. We organize for a living. Um, we can think of organizing in lots of different domains. We say we organize our personal stuff. We organize information things, different kinds of documents, ranging from Moby Dick and sort of uh, narrative document forms to transactional document forms like invoices and payments and so on. Uh, we organize all sorts of collections of resources. We give them names like library, museum, uh, zoo, uh, closet, kitchen. Right? I mean, we organize all kinds of things, both institutionally and personally. And we can look at all these and say, wow, aren't they different? I mean, libraries, let me see, does this have a pointer? So library stacks, zoos, uh, my Safeway, vineyards, uh, Amazon store, companies, my closet, my stamp collection, my iTunes. I mean, they're all collections of things. And they're all different, right, of course. No, they're all the same. They're all the same because even though we're organizing, in some cases, things, physical things, in some cases, information things, some cases, information about physical things. Some cases, things about information things. Some cases, you get the idea. Lots of different possibilities of relationships between 
organized things and the organizing, and yet somehow they're all the same because they're all some collection of resources that we've intentionally imposed order on in order to have some kind of interactions with. So they're all what I call organizing systems. And that idea of a system is really, really important because it's not how we thought about it. We thought about it very differently. We thought about it in terms of categories and systems, systems. Okay, so I use, the, you know, the definitions here are really important. I struggled for a long time to define organizing and what an organized system was. And I found settled on the word resource, which sounds perfectly fine if we're organizing web things, web resources, like you are, I, you are, I, right? Uh, and if we're organizing things in libraries, library resources, but like zoos, organizing resources? But if you say, well, they're animals, not resources, then you can't see the difference, you can't see the commonality between zoos and libraries or museums. And isn't a zoo a kind of animal museum of certain, but the animals are allowed to be alive rather than dead, things like that? I mean, so there's, they're like all these slight differences between types of organizing. If you have a narrow categorical view of them, you can't see that they're all the same in some pretty fundamental ways. So again, I want to use words like resource and collection that are fairly neutral or generic. Uh, not that the, there are not important differences between zoos and libraries, but because if we have generic words, we can more readily see some of those commonalities. Uh, intentional arrangement is essential in a discipline of organizing. We want to be able to capture the idea that some there was some explicit or implicit act by an agent. It could be a human agent or a computational agent. But somebody said at some point, let's organize this stuff. Okay, And that's important because we want to rule out situations where there is structure, where there is order, but which we can't reproduce it. If we can't reuse the stuff we learned from that system, then what's the point? It's not a discipline of organizing. So there's plenty of information in the Grand Canyon, a lot of order. I mean, we can look at the stratigraphy, the geology, and say we know a lot about how it was created, but I can't produce another one that will by following the same principles. At least not, maybe, maybe God can or something like that, but I can't, right? The point is, we can't use that pattern of organization in a way that will do us any good. So it's not kind of ruled out of organizing discipline. Now, we organize to enable some set of interactions. And interaction is one of those, you know, this is interaction design, right? Where often has a very narrow connotation in, say, computer systems development, interaction design, but you interact with any collection of resources. And some of those interactions are generic ones. I have to be able to find things, put them back, right? Remove them from the collection. And some of them are more tied to the domain of what we're organizing. But we have a lot of generic ones. We, we copy, we transform, we translate, we integrate, we recommend. These are all things we do with collections of resources that interact with those collections, either individually or as the collection as a whole. We can have properties that are individual resource properties or collection properties. And again, we, we use properties and principles to organize our collections of resources. Uh, we can use almost any property of a resource to to impose some order on it. We often use multiple properties at the same time. But if you think about it, so if we have physical things, we organize them on the basis of, of often very perceptible material properties, their size, their shape, their color, okay, their weight, okay? Um, or by their task property. We organize things that, that go together when we do some activity. But information resources, it's not as useful to organize things on the basis of the material properties. I mean, I could organize, organize my books by color, um, and that may have aesthetic benefits, but it's not as useful as organizing by some property like what they're about. Okay? So we often use semantic properties for uh, information resources. So we might use something like the Library of Congress classification of organizing this collection of resources, but we could say, how do we organize the collection of these resources? Well, we have spices. I can think of a lot of different properties I could use. Many people organize them alphabetically. Frequency of use. This is my sister's kitchen. She organizes them by cuisine and by sort of flavor palette because she's a pretty good cook. Okay. Uh, we organize people by work roles. We say people who have certain skills that do certain things together get put in the same organizational unit. So again, we can look at, at 
at a domain and say, what are the properties uh, that make sense for this domain? And we can use that uh, in a principled way to organize that collection of resources. But again, any, any resource that has an orderable name or identifier could be use that to make it alphabetic or numeric ordering. If it has an associated date, we could have many dates like creation date, acquisition date, so things to organize things on the basis of dates. Uh, we have conventional properties like who owns it, where it's from, um, what is its biological or other kind of taxonomical situation, uh, or behavioral or taxonomic property like frequency of use, correlated uses. Again, we, these are the, the, the bread and butter properties that we can use to organize a collection of resources. So the big idea has always been to say, let's not look at zoo and bank and data warehouse and closet. Let's look at organizing and say, let's emphasize things they have in common rather than things that they, on which they differ. So when you back up and say, what is the activities of organizing? We can see that all organizing follows a kind of life cycle. We have to select the resources we're going we're to organize. We have to impose that system of organization on them. We have to design and then support the resource-based interactions. And then we have to maintain the resource and the interactions over time. You go, well, yeah. Well, so let's look at your closet. Highly organized for me, maybe less for other people. Um, but an organized system for a closet would ask questions like, well, what goes in the closet? Do I put my sweaters in the closet? Do I put them in the dresser drawers? Do I organize, you know, do I sort my shirts by color or by sleeve type? Do I have suits on the left, pants on the right, outfits, right? Do I sort by uh, genre of shirts? Do I have Hawaiian shirts, you know, surfer shirts, right? I mean, Hutchins probably has a whole closet of surfer shirts, nothing else, right? Okay. <laughs> what are the interactions of your closet? What's the closet API? I do three things in closets. I insert, I take out, and I somehow manage the state of things while they're in, while they're in dirty things, while they're dirty. Those are the things I do in closets. Is this dirty or clean? I like that test. Well, I can do that in a lot of different ways. Most people probably have one bin on the floor or a pile on the floor. That's like the, the dirty clothes in the pile. I happen to have three bins, you know, lights, darks, and dry cleanings. So my API is more, is more granular, but it means I, I do more work, therefore, at organization time, but my, my, my interaction with, to go get the clothes clean is very simple. They're already sorted. That's the difference between libraries and Google. Are the categories defined in advance, or are they defined at laundry time? Again, maintenance. We have a maintenance policy in our closet. We have governance of our closet, curation. You know, when do you clean out your closet? December 29th, so you can throw out claim as tax deductions, right? Give them the goodwill and claim tax deductions on December 29th. Or I clean my closet every quarter, every semester. I gotta go sort the closet. You know, seasonal sorting, right? You know, now it's summer. Put the summer things in the front, make them more accessible, reduce that search time. You're laughing. You have a you have a policy for your closet maintenance, don't you? I completely agree with you. All right. <laughs> so how many of you have that, that Grateful Dead t-shirt from 1969? I have one of those in the back of the closet. It's special. It never gets maintained. It's in the corner and never gets touched. Okay. I have an L&R t-shirt that I've never got rid of. That's it. All right. <laughs> That's too precious to ever get rid of. Okay. Now, so we have selection, organizing, interaction, design, and maintenance. Same for data repositories, right? We say, what data sources should I be collecting? How do we assess the quality to select them? You know, what data formats do I have to use to organize? Do I have to do some transformation in order to put them in the closet, in, in the data repository? What are the most important queries? Do I have to pre-compute certain queries? Do I have access control policies, interaction policies? Then I have to have data governance, privacy. Is it FERPA, HIPAA, you name it, compliant kind of stuff. It's the same principles in my closet, but now it's a different domain. It's, it's, it's selection, organizing, interaction, design, and maintenance. So let me talk, talk uh, briefly about some of the problems that you encounter when you organize. It's a way to, to motivate, again, the systems you have organizing. Um, I'll briefly mention the thingness trap, category myopia, 
uh, blindness to bias, failing to focus. I wish I had a cleverer way for this one, architecture versus implementation, and then over and, and under organized. Now, the thing this trap is something that I learned. Um, I first was exposed to it probably as an undergrad in philosophy course, when Plato talked about carving nature at the joints in the Phaedrus dialogue. All right? um, what's the unit of analysis? What do we organize? What's the thing we're talking about? That's the fundamental question of all, of all intellectual activities. And for things that are physical, where we can see the parts, where we see the, 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 the properties at the surface, it's often easy to say, well, that's, that's where the boundaries between these things are. That's when the nature has the joints. But for things that are man-made or information resources, the boundaries are much less clear. So there's a much more difficult questions about thingness for man-made things and information things. So you know, how, you know, how many parts are there in an encyclopedia? Right? That's the kind of question we're asking. So you ask yourself, well, what is a car? Well, when I'm buying one up the lot, it's one thing. When I'm building it, it's 16,000 parts. And when I'm fixing a broken one, it's unfortunately less than 16,000 parts. <laughs> when I break that little taillight, I got to replace the whole damn assembly of the back rather than just the taillight because they don't sell it at the parts that the grand they, they build it with. So you have different, different definitions of what the thing is in different contexts. And that's true for other things, especially in these information resource collections where you have these difficult questions about, well, how big is an article? How big is a book? Is it one book or many things? All right. And we often have to organize multiple ways of the multiple different overlays at the same time of the resources. Category myopia is a problem we often run into when we look at a collection of things and say, oh, that's one of those. That's a library. All right. That's a museum. We have these, you know, deeply embedded in language and culture categories of organizing systems. And that's very convenient. It's a shorthand that brings a lot of those properties to the surface. But what it does is it emphasizes the, 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 the kind of the canonical properties, even when they're not exactly appropriate. So I can always qualify and say, well, it's kind of like a library, but it actually is a tool library. So I say, well, it's not quite a library library, but it's a library-like thing. But what it does is it makes it hard to see things which are slightly different and to see what's really important about them. So if I were to say, what is a library and try to define it, I would say, well, a library is a collection of resources where we have these kind of canonical interactions of, of sort of preservation. We, we preserve things in order to support access and reuse of the content of the library. There's often a kind of public good or community development goal uh, around that activity. And we have a conventional interaction of borrowing. We can take things and then bring them back. So this is a, uh, I say this is, the, this is the, uh, the main sleeping room at the Berkeley Library, or the texting room, because people, that's what they do there. They text and they sleep. But it's the main reading room. Uh, that's a library. We recognize that as a library. It's a very kind of canonical library. Well, as a tool library, a library. Well, it doesn't have the usual resources, but it supports some of those community goals and reuse and, and, and circulation as the normative activity. So that's a library. But what about a seed library? They call this a seed library. I go to the library of heirloom plants, seeds, and I get my garden pack, and I plant them. Do I bring them back? I bring back their children if their children are better than the parents. So if the children do good, I bring them back. So it's kind of circulation, but in a kind of a funny way. You only bring it back if it's better? What kind of library is that? Well, it's this library. It's exactly the same pattern as the library. You, you go circulate it back, and you bring it back if you can improve it. Otherwise, you don't bother bringing it back. So we can make these very fine distinctions and say, well, OK, there's a, a natural history museum is a museum of dead animals. If you, if you let them be alive, you have a zoo. Um, if you train them first, then you have a sea world like a theme park. If you let them self-organize, that's a wild animal park where they can eat each other. If you make them people instead of animals, you have Williamsburg, kind of a, a, a people theme park. And if you let them be dead, it's a cemetery. 
I mean, there's all kinds of collections of resources that are very similar in organization, but they're obviously different things, but yet they're the same in some way, right? So this like categories get in the way, all right? So we have to fix this problem of categories. We'll come back to that. Now, but because we have these categories, we have to think, oh, that's a category. It's been organized. That's the standard Library of Congress classification. That is United Nations Products and Services Code. That is ISO blah, 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 blah. It must be good. It must be you know, systematic. It's, it's you know, all that. Um, and they're often embodied in laws and regulations and other kind of institutional machinery because we want them to be you know, standard in some way. But it's easy to get swayed by that and think that somehow those are good. Standard doesn't mean good. Standard means created by some more systematic means. And often the goal of institutional categories is to, is to simply say, we think good and bad. And we're going to impose it on you to create some kind of incentives to behave in a certain way. And yet people think they must be good if it's a standard category. So we can look at something like this, the Library of Congress classification, which is how libraries, most research libraries are organized. And, you know, it's, it looks good until you say, well, really? There's like, most of it is American? And naval science is a first class thing? Well, back in 1800, it was important to how to shoot cannons off of boats and stuff. Not as important now as it was then, all right? Agriculture, where's computer science? Where's cognitive science? Q? <laughs> is cognitive science a Q? Yeah. What's computer science? Q? Q? Not technology? I mean, it's like, it's kind of weird, actually, right? I mean, yet it's, it's the Library of Congress. But of course, not every library is like this now. So some libraries use the Dewey Decimal System, and the renegade heretical libraries use this one. So this is interesting. BISAC is the category system used by booksellers. To, to decide where to put books on the shelves of bookstores. Book it's like we're doing promotions if you're you know, a publisher and Amazon and want to use this. Um, top level categories, juvenile fiction, um, self-help, okay? Um, crafts and hobbies, I think pets. Not exactly like science, technology, philosophy, right? Now, this makes the library, so some libraries are using this now, public libraries, and in such new communities, they're saying this makes it easier to find books because it's like just like the bookstore. So the bookstore and the library now look the same to you as a patient, as, as a patron. That's a good thing. Librarians are saying, the Dewey Dilemma. This is, how do we, where do we burn these people at the stake? This is heresy. I mean, it just has a bias. My favorite example is this one. Where are the trucks? There's actually only one non-truck in this entire picture, which is the BMW. The rest of these things are trucks. No way. Actually, they're all trucks. The law says they're trucks. Why does the law say they're trucks? Because General Motors bribed, I'm not, General Motors helped the US government decide how to regulate vehicles under corporate average fuel economy standards to get all the bad things that use a lot of fuel outside the system to being counted. You don't count trucks when you count fuel economy, so if you make a SUV a truck, then you don't have to worry about it being a gas guzzler. It doesn't count against you. PT Cruiser, surfer truck. <laughs> Isn't that right? You just put your boards in the back of the PT Cruiser? Truck. A what? Kook truck. Kook truck. <laughs> I don't know what that category is. All right, OK. But you get the idea. So I mean, we could go out. My, we have examples like I used to live in the city of Oakland, uh, famous for not responding very fast to public emergencies fire, crimes, everything else. So they define the category different. How long does it take to respond to a, the first response to a, to a fire call, let's say? Well, the first public vehicle that shows up is, is the first responder. So if a cop happens to drive by the fire, we're done. First responder, check off, he's there. How about, how about uh, the category uh, on-time departure from airlines? You pull away from the gate. You're on time departure. You're on the mummy for three hours, but you left on time. Okay. All right. Um, this is, so it's, it's, 
it's very biased in institutional systems, but it's also biased even more so in individual categorization because we have a context which is often way more idiosyncratic. Individuals have their own use cases that will shape the priority of their interactions. So the properties that, that used to organize your collection of your personal stuff might be very different than everybody else's stuff. So uh, I remember trying to explain once in class about how you would organize your record collection, let's say. And you say, well, you organize by genre. You know, you have classical, and you have jazz, and you have this. And oh, everyone knows you organize books by color. Actually makes your living look pretty aesthetic if you do this. It works well for small collections. It doesn't scale to the Library of Congress very well, but it works fine for small collections of books. Records, I gave this talk, and I mentioned to him in class that we should organize, most people organize records by you know, genre. And my TA says, yeah, right. I'm a disc jockey. Only thing that matters is beats per minute. So it's like there's always some property that's important to somebody, which is why it's very difficult to organize things in ways that everyone can make sense of them. So you often have these conflicts of principles where um, if you uh, cannot get agreement because there's going to be some kind of differences in principles, we have to, we have to revert to something that's more intrinsic and static. So you say, I can organize spices alphabetically because we can't agree on frequency of use. All right, so we can res resort to the to the intrinsic category that doesn't change, in order to avoid the conflict of well, I like to cook Chinese, you cook Mexican, so I should mine should be in the front. Roommates often require compromises in organizing principles. Okay, um, we often have problems with organizing where we don't focus well on what we're trying to organize. Uh, there's this word called metadata which I despise. Because metadata says, well, there's something you organize, then something that it's associated with, which is the description of the thing you're organizing somehow, and yet it's often arbitrary. So I like to think in terms of there's a primary focus and there's an associated resource that might be a description of that primary focused resource. So I call them description resources. And that's how you overcome the fact that you can't organize physical things in more than one place. You organize descriptions of them instead. But if you think about this, the problem is that it's arbitrary lots of times. So if I say, uh, think, of, think of sports, and you, and you want to organize professional athletes. Well, we have teams of athletes. Um, we organize them, um, uh, the physical players. They're in teams, they're in positions, and so on. But uh, if we like fantasy sports, <laughs> the players are irrelevant. We care about their statistics. So our, our resources that we're organizing are the statistics about the players, not the players, not the players are irrelevant. Likewise, think of the difference between if you are a, um, a biologist that studies like physical, like morphology, the shape of animals and their physical characteristics, then the specimen you collect is really important. I want to keep this dead animal on the shelf at the museum forever. Okay? But if you're a, a population biology ecologist, you care about distribution of animals, you throw the dead animal away and you keep the data about where and when you found it. That's the primary data, not that dead animal. What the hell with the dead animal? It's all in the trash. The resource that you're organizing is the, the data about the animal, not the animal itself. And you see that here we can, we can look at these different combinations. So here we, look, we get more systematic and say we could have physical things or, or, or digital things. We're very familiar with this. This is where you have the traditional physical collection organized with physical descriptions. We put the books online and we now have a, uh, sorry, we put the, Catalog online, we now have a digital description of a physical thing. Google organizes digital things about digital things. And QR codes, where you put a billboard or on a sidewalk or on the back of a, of a cereal box, is the physical description of a digital thing. Two by two, all the combinations, isn't that elegant? Okay. All right. Another problem people often encounter in organizing is, is not distinguishing architecture from implementation. I mean, Organizing is intellectual activity. We should think about it abstractly. So if we can, we should organize thinking about the principles in a way that doesn't assume an implementation. So when I say, organize your spices alphabetically, I mean, how they actually are physically laid out depends on the, it's the implementation. It's the technology layer. If you have a, uh, a, lazy, a lazy Jeff, I don't want to be sexist, Right? You, they're, they're, aimed, they're organized in a rotational way rather than on a linear way, right? 
Um, but they're all alphabetical. Now, this is not news to computer scientists. They know about three-tier architectures, but think about it. A library. If I have an online catalog, I don't move the books around. But I, and I, but I could put the books in a robotic inventory system and have 10 times as many books in the same space to save storage space. I don't change the Library of Congress classification. There's a separate layer of description. Physical layer, story, uh, conceptual layer, logic layer. And finally, we look at over and under organizing. There's no sort of right amount of organization in the abstract for any collection. It depends on its scope, its scale, its intended lifetime, um, its user, user base. So we ask these questions that are really based on trade-offs. It's like, do I organize what I have now or what I might have? Think about that. If the library said, let's get exactly the right amount of shelf space for today's collection, you can never add another book. But do you ever buy a bookcase for the books you have now and say, oh, shit, I should have bought a bigger bookcase? All right. Um, do you know the priority of those interactions? What's the most important thing you have to do? Well, maybe you don't agree with your other users. Can you defer organizing? All right. Do you do the work now or do you do it later? Who does the work? Who does the benefit? The kind of classic collaborative work question that Jonathan Gruden first raised in 1985. Okay? So, I mean, some of us invest heavily preemptively in organizing. Maybe we're doing just in case, and that may be over-investing. On the other hand, some of us probably defer too long <laughs> and spend too much time rummaging around trying to find these that could have been more easily found if we'd done a little bit of investment earlier on. So, my recommendation here is that instead of, we can solve these problems by having a more dimensional view of organizing. Say, we ask, we're asking questions. We're asking, what are we organizing? Why? How much? When and by what means? And we're defining points in a design space, regions in a design space. Not categories, but like, this is sort of library-like organization. This is, is, is museum-like organization. This is like personal collection-like organization. And there's sort of regions of organizing where you have design patterns and principles that are overused. Um, so I think this idea is unifying a lot of interesting ideas, but I want to talk for just a few minutes about, about the meta project of the, the, how the book evolved because to deal with this problem of multidisciplinarity. Um, so the book was published in last May as a print book and as different ebook formats. Kindle version and an iBook version. We're publishing new ebook versions a couple times a year. We have one coming out in, in August. Uh, but here's the challenge. Uh, and this is true of cognitive science, I'm sure, but, but it's really true in this book where I'm inventing the discipline sort of right now. And that is that you want a book to be multidisciplinary, to, to represent all the things that contribute to that discipline, but it also has to be deep enough to be credible to anybody in that discipline. So when I was writing this book, I sent a chapter out, like I sent a chapter out to Jeff Elman on relationships, you know, describing relationships. And he gave me like 5,000 words of notes saying, this is good, but a linguist would have gotten it this way. This is more nuanced, Bob. And I said, great. Computer scientist says, great, but a computer scientist would have gotten this in there. A library scientist said, yeah, but it would have got this in there. I'm thinking, the book's going to be 17,000 pages. It's not going to work as a textbook. So what I did was I said, let me sort of rethink this problem of book design and say, you've got kind of a core book plus extra stuff which is supplemental by discipline. And we do this all the time. This is what footnotes are and everything else. But, but I did it in a very organized way. And I said, let me have one third of the book in footnotes and tag them by discipline. So what we have is a book which is basically a core book, but now it has the footnotes say what discipline they're from. Okay? You can imagine a book that says, I can now configure this book by um, kind of emphasizing or underemphasizing that discipline. I can say, follow the links which are web book links or cognitive science links and ignore everything else. Okay? So in a print book, you can, you can do that by, by eye. In an ebook, you can do it by choosing to follow the tag link or not. But what we're working on is the really, really cool joystick book that says, fly toward cognitive science, or fly toward more technology, or fly toward more philosophy. And how that's going to get done isn't exactly sure, but we're working on that. And I want to get to um, a kind of notion that looks like this, where we can prepackage a book with some book. There's something, something else is here 
that might fill in the gap here, something by discipline. So we could have kind of the, the prepackaged book, but we could also imagine having books which are locally extended, where UCSD has the cognitive science program, they have cognitive science footnotes in this book that they can use in their local book, or they could even have them discovered across that network and you can find them dynamically and that kind of stuff. So we're moving toward this kind of network book with this disciplinary specific customization with some new kind of book reader, uh, uh, probably by about September. Um, let's see, there was a, a really interesting article written this summer. I mean, it was sort of interesting in a perverse way. I got a call from the Boston Globe and they said, you know, um, MIT Press published this book, and we normally ignore the MIT Press book because they're too hard to read for normal people, but this has an interesting title, and it might be interesting to people as opposed to MIT Press readers. So we want to have, a, maybe write a book review of this book for the, and they did. <laughs> now, it's, uh, this is not me. This is a really funny book about guys who does stuff like this. But the book kind of said, you know, this guy, Bob, he thinks the world should be out there organized all the time, and, and yet, I was right. <laughs> so um, it's a cool little story, and um, I think with that, I will stop. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have time for questions, or all the useful stuff comes Thank now? You. Is the question. So my, my problem with organization is that I don't know what the interaction is. I always knew that the same team I was going to interact with in multiple ways. So, so then the question is, do you do the same team in two different places or do you Well, yeah, that's a, the, the question is basically how do you deal with things that can only be in one place? And the answer is you make either copies of them or you, make, or you organize the descriptions rather than things themselves. So you know, you, we, we don't have to, we could put the same book in the stacks just once, but we can have pointers to it from different places. We do that all the time. Now, some things can be copied, that's not a problem, but physical things, that's when we had to, we had to invent like catalogs is because we only had one place to find the physical thing. Okay, I think it's time to move to the practical things. Thanks very much. <laughs>